Well, thank you. That that was that. Can, can you hear me? Is it is it live? The microphone? Yeah, great. No. I'll just yell. Uh, <laughs> but I think this is being broadcast, so we want to be sure the microphone is at least uh, on. Alex Hart, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Alex is a typical graduate student in chemistry, and we. <laughs> we yeah, it, it's uh, uh, really nice that we have something really nice to get started. Uh, we're missing a few parents, and so we're sort of holding off. Um, but I think they're they're on their way, so hopefully they'll they'll come. So welcome uh, everyone. My name is uh, Steve Boxer. I'm currently the chair of uh, the chemistry department. So first and foremost, congratulations to all of you. And a shout out to your families and friends. That's also a big deal. Okay. We're back in person. That's amazing. Uh, as a parent who's been through quite a few of these uh, myself, uh, this is the big one. So this is a really, uh, it's really great that you could, uh, you could make it. Uh, we've done a couple of these over Zoom and it just doesn't work, okay? It's just not the way, uh, a way to go. 
So many of us will be wearing masks. I'm not wearing one at the moment, and I'm not sure how I'm, how I'm going to deal with that uh, later. Um, when we're, but when we're not speaking, we probably will be wearing masks. We're also not, just, just so you know, we're not going to be doing handshakes. We're going to be doing fist, uh, you know, elbow bumps through these robes, which is a little awkward, and, and uh, we're going to have to figure out the logistics of, of doing that. Um, if anybody feels uncomfortable in the room, we have, we're broadcasting this into the adjacent room. Uh, if you want to spread out more, feel free, free, feel free uh, to go uh, to the other room. I also wanted to just thank Roger Kuhn, who's sitting here, whom you know is really uh, the the real master of ceremonies. I'm just a uh, uh, I'm just transient in this job, but Roger's the one who uh, organizes this, along with uh, Tweed Am and uh, Julian Garcia, who I think is back there in, in in the back. So thank thanks to them, and of course to to Alex. So this has been easily the craziest time any of us have ever had to deal with, I think. And uh, but we pulled through, all of us, and that's great. And it's just been the weirdest time to be a student, to be a parent, to be just about anyone. Uh, it's just not great. The last two years have they, it sucked. Uh, <laughs> it's that simple. Uh, the next years will be better. That's the the good news. Um, and you know, just a just a quick word. You know, irrespective, this is really to the uh, to the graduates at, of, at all degree levels. Um, I think here come some of the parents who are missing in action. That's good news. Yeah, <laughs> the uh, uh, irrespective is that the great. Okay, thank you. Uh, so, irrespective of your uh, specialized interest, you know, you could be physical, you could be organic, inorganic, uh, chem bio, whatever it is. Uh, you are a part of the science that produced the vaccine, okay, um, and the drugs uh, that treat COVID, and of course many other uh, uh, diseases. And this is a this was a huge victory uh, for science, really, and I think you know we collectively uh, deserve uh, to be uh, proud of it. And of course, chemistry as the central science is an essential essential part of that. So you join those heroes who made those contributions over the last uh, two or three years, of course, extending uh, way back in terms of the research that led to it. And so you're now part of this larger fabric. And I think that's really an important thing, and, I, and we welcome you uh, uh, to that. So commencements are for celebrating with families, not listening to uh, speeches from department chairs. Uh, the friends and uh, uh, connections, the lab mates, faculty, many of whom felt uncomfortable being here today and aren't here, I'm afraid, um, but many are, and the staff and the chemistry department at Stanford will remain with you. There's no doubt about that. And you'll be amazed, and I'm still amazed to this day, at how often either a remembrance of something that happened during your time at Stanford I wasn't, I wasn't a student at Stanford, but at my places where I was a student, or a contact with someone from your time here uh, will continue to impact your lives uh, well into the future. And that's a really, uh, really important thing. This is a, uh, a central part of uh, why, you, why, why you're here. So please visit and uh, stay in contact. So I'm going to hand the proceedings for the real events. We're going to hand out uh, uh, diplomas today. Uh, to Professor uh, Chris Chidsey, and he'll present the student awards, our alumna speaker, Dr. Sandra Sachs, and then the bachelor's degrees. Now, I should just say very quickly, this is a bittersweet moment for me personally uh, and for the department, as Chris was one of my first graduate students, actually, a long time ago. Um, and I've often said that uh, had it not been for the work that he did, I wouldn't be here because uh, he really uh, changed uh, changed uh, the work in my lab in, in many ways. And, and he'll be retiring this year and becoming emeritus uh, professor. Uh, so we thank him. And uh, many of you took classes from him, uh, like Dr. Sachs, who actually was a PhD student with him, got wise scientific advice uh, from him, um, or personal advice. And he'll be missed. So just a round of applause for Chris. <laughs> It's Chris. Thank you, Steve. Um, well, this is a happy occasion, and I, my my goal here is to mostly be the 
the master of ceremonies. So as you will notice in the, or at least for the first portion of this, um, as you'll notice in the, uh, in the, in the um, program, uh, we start with the awards uh, to various students in chemistry. Our first award uh, this, this year goes, it's the American Chemical Society Outstanding Organic Chemistry Award, and it goes uh, to Calvin Ryan Hansen. Calvin, please stand and come to the Um, Calvin did extensive research under the direction of Professor Noah Burns, who's with us today, and will continue on as a coterminal master's degree student in computer science. Congratulations. Let's see. Let's do this this way. We'll, we'll practice. Okay? <laughs> this is a model for... Um, <laughs> Do it one more time for this yes. practice. <laughs> All right, thank you very much. Congratulations. Um, our next series of awards uh, goes to, Ed, I don't know that we've said this, it's probably obvious from the program, but we are celebrating the uh, graduations of three years worth of folks that have accumulated, I think is a fair term, uh, over this awful pandemic, and Zoom is not a, an adequate celebration of their successes. So we have uh, three years worth of folks uh, finishing up today, or acknowledging that they've already finished up. Um, and and um, that's germane to the next award, which goes to members of three cl classes. This is the Merck Index Award to outstanding students in chemistry based in, on scholastic achievement in the department. Uh, and I'm gonna read your names, ask you to come forward. Um, I will make the award, but then I would like you to stay because we wanna get a photograph of all six of you. Um, so the, from 2020, Samuel B. Holscher. Stand there with that heavy uh, paperweight, and uh, this the, the Merck Index is a is a classic in chemistry, uh, and uh, uh, of course all this information is now online. But it, it <laughs> any decent scientist needs to have something on their bookshelf. So, <laughs> all right, uh, J. Minsu Liu, also from the class of 2020. Now from the class of 2021, Sarah Frigi is not able to be with us, so she has gotten her award separately, and Helena Miranda roberts Matarik. Um, and now in the class of 2022, um, uh, we have three award winners. Let's start with Niharika ben, uh, Bandlapali. Congratulations. William David Chow. And finally, Calvin Ryan Hansen, also from the class of 2022. Congratulations. Now, um, I'm, yes, okay. <laughs> and you get that, let's, yeah. let's sort of swing over. Swing. Yes. Yes, there, there we go. go. Just the balloons yes, in the background. Sir. We 
Everybody look this way. One, two, three. Excellent. Great work. Thank you all. Congratulations. And this brings us to the most uh, prestigious award in the department, um, which is the SS and IMF Marsden Memorial Prize in Chemistry. Uh, this award recognizes and encourages undergraduate research in chemistry, and it's for, it's for an outstanding undergraduate student who has been involved in significant research in chemistry and is or has gone on in chemistry. And um, I believe we have two of the three winner, winners from the last three years here. Um, and I'll ask the two of you to stay, and we'll do the same thing we just did. But before that, I have to explain a little bit more about this award. This award uh, was given in memory, well, it's, was a, it was endowed by um, Sully Marston, who was a undergraduate in this department went on to become a petroleum engineer and was on the faculty at Stanford for many years and would always show up and sit in the back of this event while he was still alive and give this award personally. It's important to understand that the MM stands for Marsden Memorial for his two parents, um, but he thought it was important to symbolize this award with a particularly uh, telling <laughs> Uh, so he always gave out M&Ms to every award winner, and so I have continued that tradition <laughs> in his absence. Um, and uh, this award comes with this great plaque. Of course, not only do you need books on your shelves, you need plaques on your walls. <laughs> um, and most importantly, a check from uh, the, this award to the recipient. So our first recipient from 2020 is So Young Lee. So Young. <laughs> Congratulations. <laughs> um, the second award winner who wasn't able to be with us is, is Matthew Harry Hall from 2021. Um, um, and this gives me an, actually an opportunity to mention that where all these folks are. Um, so Young is at MIT and Matt is also at MIT. Matthew's at MIT. Our next award winner, um, I'm sorry, did I get something wrong? Yes, no. our next award winner will also be going to MIT. <laughs> <laughs> India Wingate Cox. Congratulations, <laughs> India. Our final award is not to undergraduates, it's to graduate students. It's the Centennial Teaching Assistant Award. This award recognizes graduate students for tremendous service and dedication in providing excellent classroom instruction for Stanford students. Our winners this year, we have four, are Michael Chen, Pablo Elvira, Robert Gibson, and Yuran Shi. And two of them are able to be with us today. So, three of them. Three. Oh. Pablo sitting. Oh, Pablo, here. yes. Come forward, please. And I Sorry, know. you're <laughs> he will be graduating in a few minutes. Okay. So let's do this. The uh, we'll start with, with uh, well Pablo, you're here. <laughs> oh, and Michael Chen's here. Oh Michael, Michael, you're here. Oh, okay. All right, we're just going to do this in this order. <laughs> All right. Great. All right, just please wait for a second. Robert. Okay. Congratulations. All right. And finally, 
Uh, you're on? Yes. Well, not finally. <laughs> hold, hold it. Oh, oh. Hey, hey, it's yours. <laughs> <laughs> this is the transfer. <laughs> thank you. And Michael. Yes, thank you. Congratulations. Thank you. All right, please uh, hang out here, and you can, if you're willing, take off your mask and we'll get a photo. Take Excellent. Smile. <laughs> Sometimes I trip up here. I, I was supposed to mention that this comes with, of course, the certificate you saw, but also a financial award recognizing the incredibly important service that great TAs play in our department. Um, now it's my pleasure to introduce our alumna speaker for today, Dr. Sandra Sachs. Dr. Sachs is a forensic scientist who's developed cutting edge analytical methods in forensic science. Perhaps we'll hear a little bit about that today. Um, uh, I, we've been friends for a very long time, and though I am not in forensic science and have a relatively limited knowledge of the field, I was at a party at her house one time and one of her colleagues mentioned that she was great on the stand and defense attorneys under cross just did not dare <laughs> challenge her scientific uh, information. So that's about all I know about forensic science. We may learn more today. <laughs> Dr. Sachs hails from Nebraska and is an alumna of Stanford Chemistry PhD program. She did her PhD with me, examining electron transfer through conjugated oligomers early in my time here at Stanford. In addition to her key scientific work, Sandra made many contributions I'll not, um, that I won't forget, um, but I'd just like to highlight three. Um, I had brought to Stanford an old piece of equipment, a piece of equipment that when it was new, my baby, my young daughter had, uh, had named Jico because it had a giant eye in the middle of the front door of this piece of equipment, kind of like a cyclops, and she thought this was the personification of her imaginary friend that lived in the attic at our house. <laughs> um, Sandra inherited JICO, not from my daughter, but from my previous technician. <laughs> and when Sandra was in the research group, she was responsible for maintaining this somewhat idiosyncratic uh, piece of equipment. Uh, so thank you for that, Sandra. And uh, uh, you, you set the stage for, for many uh, uh, subsequent uh, folks. Um, the second thing I want to mention about her is that uh, the the uh, process of getting tenure any, at any major institution is a, is a huge deal. And uh, um, Professor Boxer kindly made some remark about that with regard to my work in his lab. I want to pass on the, the favor and say that uh, not only was Sandra's scientific accomplishment absolutely essential uh, to my uh, success here at Stanford, but she was absolutely integral to putting together the public package that would be sent out to various folks to review my work or our work. And it was not an easy time for me uh, at that stage in my life. And I owe an incredible debt of gratitude because Sandra really helped me at, with scientific knowledge pull together an excellent package. So thank you, Sandra. Uh, and finally, um, I, I want to highlight something a little lighter, but was, what turned out to be really important uh, later in my career. Uh, Sandra was working on electrochemistry and distressed to find that there was not at that time a course in electrochemistry at Stanford. So she took it upon herself to organize a informal course among graduate students, which she led out of a famous textbook called Bard and Faulkner. And that became the genesis of a graduate course I taught and then the additions I made to the undergraduate teaching program, and some of you guys have had the pleasure or frustration <laughs> of, uh, of seeing the final, the final version of that over the last few years. Uh, so thank you for getting that all started. Um, and uh, what's most important uh, was that Sandra helped to build a really collaborative culture within the lab. She was the first woman in the lab. And uh, just set the tone for the next 30 years. So thank you very much, Sandra. Now, with that, I'd like to introduce you to uh, tell us something about 
where folks with chemical backgrounds are headed. Thank you, Chris. I'm old enough I need these, so mm -hmm. let me take a moment to put them on. Uh, I'm so glad to be here today. I'm going to start with the venue, Old Chemistry. I'd like to share with you some of the lore that is passed down about this building before it was known as the SAP building. And in all likelihood, it's apocryphal, but entertaining. I started at Stanford only four years after the Loma Prieta earthquake. Many buildings on campus were closed with chain link fencing, do not enter signage, and were in great need of refurbishment and retrofitting, this building included. Once the Cantor Arts Center reopened while I was still a student, I held out hope that this building would be brought back to its former glory, but stories circulated of mercury and other heavy metal contamination in the effluent and concern over the cost of remediation. I heard that graduate students played a joke on Professor Tauby by putting ammonia in the pipes and inviting him to smell the off-gas product, causing a momentary eureka moment that one holy grail of chemistry, atmospheric pressure and temperature production of ammonia replacing the Haber method, had been found in the alchemic catalyst present in the outflow. <laughs> but this is a complete nerdy digression from what brought me here today to this beautifully restored building which is to assist to celebrate your accomplishments as graduates, recognize this special moment in each of your lives, and to pass along some hard-won professional advice. I could stand here orating life's secret keys, wisdom revealed to me over the near, nearly two and a half decades post Stanford. I would be full of it. The secret really is that life is messy, luck is involved, Trust your instincts. A purposeful career gets you through lean times. The grass isn't always greener. Know your history. Accumulated scientific knowledge is more impactful when shared. So for what it's worth with these thematic platitudes, here is my story. Luck. I was nearing the end of my graduate career, having pursued a PhD with the intent that I would teach chemistry at the collegiate level. I had become disillusioned with that clear path and was in the particular funk about what to do with my impending degree. I resorted to the internet, vastly turbocharged by the new, these new things called search engines. I used Alta Vista, which was the most comprehensive at the time, Stanford connection and founder Flaherty there, but subsumed by another Stanford-driven search engine a few years later. Maybe you've heard of them? Google. A company my husband explored joining when they had 20 employees. Didn't go. Let that sink in. <laughs> he, he ended up at Apple, so we are OK. But, <laughs> but I do a digress. <laughs> Back to search engines. I was looking for professions in the applied sciences, considered patent law, but rejected that on the disappointing prospect of another three years of law school, which didn't appeal to me. More searches later, I stumbled upon forensic science and found an international conference in LA in a few months, driving distance away with a $100 student registration and my in-laws couch available on which to crash. Lucky no moment number one. I don't know how many conferences each of you have attended in your chemistry careers, but this forensic group was very different. At a reception, not knowing anyone, I nurtured my wallflower tendency and fully expected to get my free student dinner of cheese and crackers and bust out of there early. However, I stayed the entire time, having met no fewer than 15 people, some of whom I remain in touch with to this day, who saw that I was awkwardly off to the side and decided to hear what brought me to the conference, and they were genuinely interested in my answers. This simply did not happen at the chemistry conferences I had previously attended. I met several people from the San Francisco Police Department Crime Laboratory, learned from them at a UC Berkeley extension course in forensic science that I could take and that SFPD was hiring. Lucky moments number two and three. So a slight detour. As graduates, I have a word of warning to you about government careers. <laughs> Government hiring cycles are very long. I applied for the San Francisco Police Department job, completed the intro forensic science course, interviewed, got pregnant, wrote my def and defended my thesis, 
bought my first house and had my first child before I filled the vacancy I had heard about one and a half years earlier. The hiring process moves slowly until it doesn't. About nine months after I put in my SFPD application, I was called with the question as to when I could interview later that week with no forewarning that they had even been interested in my application. I try as hiring manager now to give candidates information as soon as I receive it, but not all of arms of government have this luxury. If it's a government job that you want, be prepared to hurry up and wait. All right, the platitude of trust your instincts. I was lucky enough to earn a job offer from SFPD and decided to trust my instincts and join this lab proximal to Palo Alto that I had learned about at the Friends and Conference. After all, I reasoned if I hated the job, I could always find another Silicon Valley position in a few months. This landed me, quite fortuitously, in a laboratory steeped in a tradition of the generalist. Many service laboratories train people to conduct a few methods or assays, use one or two pieces of equipment, expect you to ride your career out happy to be a button pusher. Some forensic laboratories, while not quite this bad, do lean this direction. SFPD was not one of those laboratories. My first five years were amazing. I learned how to apply chemistry, micro microscopy, instrumental analysis skills to my training in seized drug identification, breath and blood alcohol testing, human performance and post-mortem toxicology, gunshot re residue, fiber, fire debris, among other analyses, along with the added challenge to present my findings in court, just to keep things interesting. And without dwelling too much on the negative, after a change at the SFPD lab, my spidey senses activated, I had ethical concerns, and that led me to believe that the changes were not going to work out well. You can Google the rest. Long story short, trusting my instincts a second time, I looked for employment elsewhere, again in government. Miraculously, I found and started a new government job within three months, absolutely unheard of in government, I mean, excuse me, glacial time. The job was to perform death investigation and human performance toxicology at the SF Medical Examiner's Office. I was excited to develop a new skill set and the challenge of defending my new discipline in court. I learned an enormous amount. I enjoyed my time there and a few of my favorite anecdotes about the oddities of the forensic profession come from that office. To set the scene, across the hall from the toxicology lab was the autopsy suite and the storage area of decedents. At the end of the shared hallway was a sally port where arrivals were accepted. If a particularly decomposed decedent arrived, everyone was instructed to put Vicks VapoRub under their noses. I have some inappropriate for graduation tales involving maggots and will go no further. <laughs> anyway, not long after I began, there was a need to repackage brains that had been collected at autopsy. I had the unpleasant task of literally dumping brains from the original buckets into more rigid containers. Coincidentally, my husband was in between his non-Google job and his next pre-Apple job and was taking time to ski with our eldest child. The entire time I was repackaging brains, I was thinking brain dumping versus skiing. Brain dumping when I could be skiing and very unfairly was getting madder and madder at him. <laughs> a purposeful career. The transition from brain dumping to purposeful career is a stretch, I'll admit. In my 20 plus year forensic science career, I eventually left toxicology and returned to criminalistics work similar to SFPD, but at Oakland PD and ascended the ranks of management to eventually lead the lab. I have found my work rewarding. Many incorrectly ascribe this to catching bad guys. I don't view my profession that way. I consider cases I have worked individually, each with an interesting analytical challenge, followed by being prepared to defend my work in court, maintaining no vested interest in the outcome. The evidence tells the story and I am its interpreter. I have had DAs assume that I am on their side even when the evidence is counter to their narrative and defense counsel surprised when I agree with them ascribing it. But I ascribe this to the adversarial legal system where was it one is either for or against, but I like to think I represent this side of truth. There are notable cases throughout a forensic scientist's career that rise above the noise, and I will share one near the end of my re remarks today. So know your history. 
I have felt early on I had to apologize for my forensics career. I gave a talk titled Adventures of Applied Scientists, laying out arguments in favor of applied science. The tale involved Pasteur and Perkin, two 19th century chemists, an astrophysicist, Peng Gapashkin, and natural philosopher, Newton. And I'll tell a foreshortened version in the interest of time, but these stories demonstrate the tug and pull experienced by famous scientists in their career to illustrate to you what may be ahead of you. Pasteur, best known for food chemistry contributions like pasteurization, took his classical education at École Normale Supérieure seriously, he took it seriously and famously stated that in experimental science, chance favors only the prepared mind. When contamination problems with beer and wine came to him, he assisted those industries. Thank you, Pasteur. <laughs> He may have argued with me that there is a distinction between research and applied science when he stated, there are no such things as pure and applied science. There are only science and the applications of science. Maybe quoted in a peak similar to the situation I find myself in and apologizing. He noted to the French Academy of Letters that experimental method may never be able to solve completely the riddle of the universe, but is enchanting nonetheless. Cecilia Payne Gapashkin could be the most eminent scientist you've never heard of. Born in 1900 England, she was classically trained at the Cavendish Laboratories in Cambridge. She majored in physics with astronomy as a diversion. After graduation, she secured a position at the Harvard College Observatory. Drawn by Harvard's prolific spectral library of plates that preserved light composition of thousands of stars, Cecilia's courses from Rutherford, who fused physics with chemistry to discover the proton, and her familiarity with Bohr's and Einstein's work, which fused physics with other disciplines, were instrumental for her to fuse astronomy and launch the field of astrophysics. Upon analyzing the spectral plate, she discovered that the stars were comprised mostly of hydrogen, at odds with the conventional wisdom at the time. It is a fight to get and that was at odds with the conventional wisdom at the time. It was a fight for her to get the data to win her argument. Modern astronomers have stated it was undoubtedly the most brilliant PhD thesis ever written in astronomy. The American Physical Society News, the giants Copernicus, Newton, and Einstein, each in his turn brought a new view of the universe. Payne's discovery of the cosmic abundance of the elements did no less. If you ever wondered how we know about the comp composition of the stars. Read Payne Gaposchkin's biography by Donovan Moore and you'll know. Nobel laureate in chemistry Dudley Hirschbach righted a wrong in 2002 by commissioning a painting of Payne Gaposchkin for the Hall of Professors at Harvard in what he called an affirmative action for portraits. Ironically, and perhaps intentionally, Payne Gaposchkin's portrait hangs 30 feet away from President Lowell's who had declared during Cecilia's tenure at the Harvard Observatory that no woman should be granted a teaching appointment at Harvard. Newton. Isaac Newton's story is probably familiar, so why did I include him as an applied scientist? I hope to impart to you today some surprising elements of the career of this revered national, natural philosopher. Newton spent the plague of 1665 at home away from infectious towns. Legend has it he observed the apple fall on his home farm, and by 1666, the core idea of gravity took hold in manuscript form, but was put aside for 20 years due to a calculation error before refinement birthed the Principia. Upon its publication in 1687, this instant masterpiece set Newton's reputation as a scientific tour de force. Maybe your Stanford plague years have made you equally productive. Get ready to dust off that manuscript. After success with Principia, what was left for Newton? Biographer Thomas Levinson quipped, it is unfair to ask for two Principias from any man. So after 35 years at Cambridge, Newton experienced a grass is greener moment and wanted to be closer to the energy hub of England. He asked, colleagues for placement into lucrative government positions. 
Eventually, in 1696, Newton came to London to take up the post of Warden of the Royal Mint. By law and tradition, the position required him to protect the king's currency, which meant that he was supposed to deter or capture anyone who dared clip or counterfeit it. In practice, that made him a policeman, or rather, a criminal investigator, an interrogator, and a prosecutor rolled into one. What Lin-Manuel Miranda did for the image of Hamilton, I hope without the singing, <laughs> to leave you with a new impression or a new appreciation for Newton as a kick-butt forensic scientist who became a justice of the peace, rounded up counterfeiting suspects, identified forged metal templates, and prosecuted cases worthy of a CSI episode 17th century style. Successful at running prosecutions in a small matter of simultaneously recoining 100,000 silver pounds per week, twice the capacity deemed possible, he rose to the post of Master of the Mint in 1699, a position in which he remained until his death in 1727, at 85, having secured his fortune. So, accumulated scientific knowledge is more impactful when shared. And the subtitle of this, Support Databases and Reference Collections. Without Harvard, the Harvard trove of star spectra and a prepared mind, astrophysics would not have shifted in the thinking of the stars that were comprised primarily of earthly elements. Indeed, astronomers assumed, based on the principle of uniformity in nature, that all heavenly bodies were composed of the same elements in similar proportions found on Earth. It took a woman with gumption cutting the teeth at the esteemed Cavendish lab in hours and hours of tenacity applied to Harvard's spectrographic plates to form the revelatory idea that stars are primarily made of hydrogen. But why had the plates been collected? In 1879, during Pasteur's lifetime, a professor of botany, William Beale, at what is now Michigan State, buried 20 glasses of bottles with seeds in sand to answer the question, if farmers faithfully weeded their plots, how long would these plants keep coming up from seeds already in the dirt? This experiment has long outlived the progenitor, and it will continue another 80 years, and has yielded many new answers to questions Professor Beale could never have formulated. But were weeds his only reason to start the experiment that outlived him? The Svalbard Global Seed Vault in Norway, a conceptual and engineering marvel, houses over 1.1 million seed varieties to secure the world's future world, uh, food supply. Is this project simply a magnanimous Norwegian gesture to the world? In Denmark, birth cohort studies where specimens such as blood, maternal, placental, and infant, um, and swabs from the birth canal and uh, an infant nasal, ca nasal cavities they are taken and archived to study the effects of markers or microbiomes on disease expression. Are these lengthy longitudinal studies only for learning about disease in the cohort? Back to forensic science in the United States. NIST mass spectral databases have proved instrumental to drug chemistry work in the crime lab. FBI's general rifling characteristics and ATF's National Integrated Ballistic Information Network, or NIBIN databases, assist with firearms comparison work. Automated Fingerprint Identification Systems, or AFIS, a network for latent print searches, including FBI's database, innumerable collections of paints and fibers and other trace evidence kept by the FBI and other organizations. Without these databases and collections, where would the field of forensic science be? I'll tell you with a vastly narrower ability to form meaningful conclusions or provide investigatory leads. To drive this last point home, I'll discuss a sobering case from my laboratory. In 1979, a 45-year-old mother named Betty Jean Elias <clears throat> was found deceased in her Oakland apartment in what was a heinous crime scene. The primary suspect was her boyfriend who fled. Evidence was collected, but by 1980, the case went cold. Reviewed by Oakland PD in 2002, the original fingerprint evidence was compared to Caldeo J, J prints from the boyfriend, but there was no match and the case went cold again. Orifice slides from the coroner surfaced and were submitted to OPD for DNA analysis, which began in 2015. A cold hit was made 
in the FBI's combined DNA index system or CODIS database and a name was provided. Reference samples confirmed the hit. Since the DNA profile came from sperm on a slide, the suspect could claim that it was present due to a consensual act. Therefore, more analysis was done on a bloody fingerprint determined to be Betty Jean's blood and identified the CODIS hit subject's fingerprints in that blood. In 2019, a jury convicted the suspect of murder. Betty Jean Elias's daughter said, I feel that OPD believing in me and sending out that DNA, if it wasn't for that, we wouldn't be here. I'll finally have justice for my mom and closure for my family. We've waited so long for this. What made this possible was the existence and continued support, both in concept and financial, of the CODIS database. The suspect was a transient who had served a federal sentence in Virginia for a crime committed in Montana, and that's why he was in the database. And he was not known to have ever been in Oakland. Thus, he was never a suspect in the case. Absent CODIS, this suspect would have gotten away with the crime. I place all of these exercises to collect, curate, organize, and make useful the celestial spectrographs, seeds, microbiome samples, mass spectral libraries, APHIS, NIBIN, CODIS, into the same category of human endeavors of attempting to observe the world and record it and ask and understand why, and in so doing, giving back tools to answer other unasked questions and to solve new mysteries. These are all manifestations of the considerable, considerable gift applied science routinely gives the world. So back to you as graduates. To sum up, luck is involved. Trust your instincts, have a purpose, and know your history. During days when you may question your decision and grass and greener grass is greener angst, they may be ahead for you. Know that the variables you considered that led to your selected career path are valid. Your pro-con balance, not other people's, is important. Every career choice will have its dumping brains into bucket moments, <laughs> but that the high points need to be revisited as well. I presented my research in Hong Kong, have published in the Journal of Forensic Sciences, and have an utterly cool cocktail party banter with my career choice. So show of hands, who's heard, oh, I hated chemistry in high school when you say you're <laughs> a chemist? <laughs> yes. However, I have not cured cancer, engineered a material for space travel, or had my research on the cover of science. On the other hand, I have three beautiful children and a loving husband and have had the good fortune to raise them in Palo Alto. Yet I wonder if the life in academia would have been for me. Ironically, one reason I didn't pursue academia was I didn't want to be supported entirely by grants. And now I find my grant writing is an imperative to fund three quarters of my laboratory's budget. <laughs> These grasses greener Second guesses of your professional choices are going to exist. Either admit it's part of the deal or you do something about it. Like Newton leaving London, leaving for London to become the men's chief detective, when your second Principia doesn't come to you, either be satisfied with your previous accomplishments or have the courage to make a change. My last appeal. Support databases and longitudinal studies, even if they are simple in design, empirical in nature, and applied. It is the prescience of past scientists to allow us to determine that 142-year-old seeds can still germinate. And to ponder what black and white lines on a spectrographic plate mean and understand their connection to the constitution of the heavens. To dream about their unrevealed secrets and more pr pragmatically, to convict the guilty or exonerate the innocent and bring closure to victims and their families. Again, to you graduates, you are each an amazing, trained scientific gift to the world. And no doubt, chance will favor your prepared minds. Recall your Stanford experience fondly, or not, but <laughs> recollect them as you make your mark. Follow your desire to make a fulfilling profession. You will have setbacks and hard days. Remember, it's the integration over your career that matters. 
and enjoy the moments that make it some positive. Best of luck to you. Thank you very much, Sandra. Um, all those plates, all those <laughs> photographic plates of star, starlight. Um, so now we come to the to the um, the big point of our ceremony, which is the awarding of degrees. Um, and I'm going to start by. Um, making a, um, a few announcements about what you're looking at in your program. Um, the first is that unfortunately some alumni will not be with us and there may be a little bit of uh, awkwardness around that, so bear with me. Uh, so you'll see names in the program of people who are not able to attend, but that's to recognize that they are indeed graduates this year or in previous years. Uh, the second thing I want to uh, give you a sense of is what some of the designations of people's degrees are. So I'll be awarding the bachelor's degrees, and uh, my colleague, uh, Professor uh, Sigelski, will, will award the advanced degrees. Um, within the bachelor degree categories, there are several uh, additional uh, honors. So where it says honors, that means that the student has done additional coursework and extensive research leading to a thesis which they have submitted to the department for the work, the research work they have done as undergraduates. Distinction um, means that the student has graduated in the top 15 percent of the class university-wide. Phi Beta Kappa is membership in a uh, in, in the America's most prestigious academic honor society and this comes from excellence across the board in liberal arts and sciences. And then finally this year, we're, we're pleased to have a J.E. Wallace Sterling Award winner. And this award is for academic excellence in the School of Humanities and Science and goes to the top 25 students uh, in this School of uh, Humanities and Sciences, which is the vast bulk of, of the school, um, the students. All right, with that, um, now we're going to have a bit of a, a little bit of logistics here. So will the classes of 2020 and 2021 please stand and assemble up and to my right? Thank you, Alex. Our first recipient, Michael John Archidi Akono. Now, this is a little complicated. You proceed there and receive your diploma from the chair. <laughs> and then I think you go back to your chair. <laughs> All right. We'll get this down. <laughs> All right. Sofia Christodolo Rubelkava. Uh, Sorry. <laughs> Sofia. <laughs> Congratulations. <laughs> Alejandra Esparza Young. Congratulations. 
Spencer Chen Guo. Thank you. Congratulations. Samuel B. Holscher with distinction. So Young Lee with honors and distinction. Congratulations. J. Min Su Liu with honors and distinction Phi Beta Kappa. Veronica Elizabeth Stafford. <laughs> Julia Tanzo. Joe Nock Haivo. Cara Elizabeth Will. And now to the, those members of the class of 2021 who are with us, Jacob Seth Badia. Oh, sorry. This is why I have Roger here. <laughs> Jacob, with distinction, okay. congratulations. <laughs> Elena Miranda Roberts Matarik with distinction Phi Beta Kappa. <laughs> now, uh, will the class of 2022 stand and please assemble to my right? Cesar Enrique Armas. Congratulations, thank you. <laughs> Niharika Bonlapali with distinction Phi Beta Kappa. Congratulations, <laughs> Thank you. 
William David Cho. <laughs> With distinction. <laughs> Congratulations. India Wingate Cox, with honors and distinction. J. E. Wallace Sterling, I'm sorry, uh, with honors and distinction. <laughs> Dante John Dulles. Calvin Ryan Hansen with honors and distinction, J. E. Wallace Sterling Award. <laughs> David Lee. Michelle Ayame Kaime Pono Morata. <laughs> Vani Shirhashita uh, Musa Nuri with honors. Alexander Gisaburo Hamamura Nelson, with honor. Congratulations. Karen Nahomi Perla Correa. Brian Anthony Romero. <laughs> and now I would like to introduce my colleague, Professor Lynette Sigelski, Director of Graduate Studies, to award the advanced degrees. Lynette. Thank you, Chris. Well, I'd like to just uh, congratulate again Professor Chidsey on his extraordinary career, echoing the remarks of Professor Boxer, and a genuine thank you, Chris, for all of your collegiality over the years and your extraordinary leadership in our undergraduate studies as well as graduate studies. Thank you. You're here. And now I'm delighted to welcome and honor our advanced degree recipients. So will our Master of Science and Doctor of Philosophy recipients please rise and make your way around this way, please, in alphabetical order to the side aisle.
you. We honor two Master of Science recipients. First, William David Chow. Congratulations. <laughs> Next, Julio Joseph Salerno. <laughs> and next, for our PhD, for our Doctor of Philosophy graduates, we celebrate their achievements and welcome them into our special community through the hooding ceremony. Our PhD graduates now face the world with a powerful and unique perspective through their determination and their fascination with chemistry and molecular science. They are innovators and have launched over hurdles to be the first to make unique discoveries and see things in a new way. Our previous graduates have gone on to run the world's largest companies, launch their own companies and develop new technologies to lead universities and still devote time to service to contribute to and make our world a better place. We are pleased to recognize and hood each of our new PhD graduates in this spirit. I will introduce each of our, can each of our recipients and read the name of the PhD thesis, surely making all of the family and friends proud and possibly also bewildered. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and I will ask if the PI or mentor uh, faculty member is here for hooding to join at the same time. Otherwise, I will be delighted to perform the ceremonial hooding. So our first Doctor of Philosophy recipient, Christian Forrest Chamberlain, on micro droplet chemistry and on-demand drug release systems. reporters based on cephalosporin to detect drug resistant bacteria for research and diagnosis. Examining the role of neuron glia signaling in the peripheral nervous system. Castillo, multi-omic characterization of segmental graft dysfunction in liver transplant patients. Daniel Farr studies toward the enantioselective synthesis of briarane diterpenes. Matt Huang, 
Wong, a framework for automated structure elucidation from routine NMR spectra and applications and mechanisms of organic reactions in alkali salt media. <laughs> Physical Modeling of the Spreading and Maintenance of Epigenetic <coughs> Modifications. <laughs> Jenchin Michael Wu. Deep Learning in Computational Biology, from Predictive Modeling to Knowledge Extraction. Rechargeable batteries of sodium chlorine, lithium chlorine, and aluminum graphite. Our advanced degree recipients will rise. We can all congratulate them. Thank you. And Professor Boxer with our closing remarks. So I stand, <coughs> I stand between you and lunch. Uh, the uh, so. Once again, you know, congratulations to, to everyone, and I'm, it's just so great that we're able to do this uh, in person. Let me thank Chris again and thank Lynette. This was really uh, great. A um, couple of closing remarks. So lunch, which is what you're all waiting for, is directly up there. So if you go out here and up, I should also note for anybody who's interested, there are restrooms if you go out here to the left um, inside, inside the building. Um, Stay as long as you like. Um, the weather is pretty good. It's not great. Uh, 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 you'll miss Stanford, and uh, we'll miss you. Uh, so. so the bachelor of students, we want you to stay a little bit for a few minutes to get a photo, OK, a collective group photo. I don't know if we're going to do this with all three classes together. Yeah, yes. so we're going to do the emerged photo. Faculty are going to move up, uh, move chairs up. And so just, just don't, don't leave. Parents, don't go running for your kids. They're, they'll, 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 they'll be there. And last thing, you know, once again, you guys should stand up, turn around, and thank, <clears throat> thank the people out there. Okay. Thanks for coming. <laughs>